Well, hey, Cascade Church, welcome to another Wednesday's Word. There's a few things I want to point out about gardens that are in my past Bible reading through the Daily Audio Bible, and they're timely because we're about to Easter, and we'll see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, something I was just reading about today. And every time I get into a garden, my mind starts pricking up. This is something I'm learning from the Bible Project, and they're reinforcing it, to be more precise. But the Bible is a story written by a lot of different people over 4,000 years, 66 different books, but there are common themes. The Bible Project calls them hyperlinks. So on the computer, if you see a document and it's like in blue usually, you click on it, it takes you somewhere else. And that's designed to make sure that you see how things are integrated across the web. The Bible was written with a similar intent where there's metaphors, master themes that go through things. Um, if you're not used to computer language, think about light motifs in, mu in musicals or, or Broadway productions. You see somebody come on and there's always the same sort of note or tune. Um, Darth Vader coming in with that um, what infamous theme song, The Emperor's March. Those things begin to associate us with a certain emotional state. It gets us ready to see a part of the story. And so the Bible begins in a garden of temptation. God puts Adam and Eve in a garden. Satan, well, it's not technically called Satan, but it's the serpent who's often associated with Satan, comes and tempts them. And in that temptation, they fail and they're driven out of the garden. The Bible ends in another garden that's free of temptation. So Adam and Eve were able to sin, but they were also able to not sin. Because of their sin, sin is in all of us, we're no longer able to stop from sinning. Sin's just part of our nature. In theology, we call that original sin. And at the end of time, we'll be so redeemed that sin won't even be an option for us. We'll be completely in love with God, completely have our hearts written with the law of God on them, like Jeremiah says. And so you see these big garden scenes at the bookends of the Bible. And then throughout the time of the Bible, you see little segments of it. So Abraham leaves, he goes to the promised land. The first thing he goes to are the oaks of Mamre, which is similar word to garden in Hebrew. And in our passages lately, we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's being tempted. He's praying. He's saying, let this cup pass from me. He doesn't want to go to the cross, but he's willing to. Not as I will, Lord, but, but whatever you will. And so it's another Garden of Temptation, and this time Jesus, the true and perfect, the second Adam, as Paul calls him in Romans, is faced with the accusation, and he passes the test. Jesus had a foretaste of this when he went to the desert, which was the opposite of a garden. So you no longer have God's provision, a forsakenness of God. And he's confronted directly by Satan there, and he withstands that temptation. And so you see that God is building us toward this climax in the book of um, Matthew and, and Mark, where the Garden of Gethsemane happens. It's going to lead us to the book of Revelation, where the garden is now safe. The serpent's been driven out. We no longer have to be worried about being tempted and distracted. We're free to love God. We're free to love our neighbor. Others always don't fare that well. In the book of Numbers, you see some spies go, and they begin to seek out this new, I guess you could call it a garden. God has provided. There's huge grapes. There's abundant land. It's very much like the Garden of Eden. But they fail because they're scared. They're I'm worried about the size of the giants. They say the giants are bigger than us. In their eyes and in our own eyes, we look like grasshoppers. And so they are facing that same temptation, except for Caleb and Joshua. All the others say God's not big enough to take this on. God can't do this. So picture them next to Jesus. Both of them saying, I see what you want to accomplish, God, but I don't want to go. Joshua and Caleb, along with Jesus, are saying, God, you're able, whatever, not what I will, but what you will. The unfaithful spies and Adam and Eve see the same temptation and they begin to back away. And this is where the Bible gets personal because not only did Jesus literally go to a cross, but he's also shaping us so that we can be like him. The goal of discipleship, which is being filled with the Spirit of God, being conformed, shaped by the Bible, we read the Bible not just to say, I read the Bible. We read the Bible to say, I want this in my heart. I want this to be written across my character. And so our goal is to stand like Jesus did. When we see temptations, when we're called to suffer, we say, God, not what I will, but what you will. And this can be very hard. 
sometimes we're tempted because, um, you know, it's just the easy temptations, not easy to deal with, but easy to think about the alcohol, the sex, the stealing, you know, maybe cutting corners at your work. But you think about the deeper ones, the temptation to not suffer well, the temptation to not deal with integrity when you're in conflict, all these other things. And we're called to say, okay, Lord, I see this fake garden, this this what I think paradise would look like. I'm going to lie. I'm going to do a little bit of manipulation so that everybody likes me because that's what I think uh, sort of paradise would look like. And instead, we're called to speak the truth. We're called to be people of integrity, to step into what God would have us go into, not our own making. And so as I've been reading the Bible lately, those are the sort of things that I grab onto. If you're seeing a theme or a, or image that's related and brought up again and again, start thinking, why is this so common? The Bible was not written to cover everything that we could know about God, but to direct our attention to the most important parts. And so when they're talking about sacrifices, and sacrifices come up so often, why is God interested in sacrifice? And it's interesting because we just got through the book of Leviticus, and then in the book of Psalms, Psalm 50, God says, I really don't want your sacrifices. I want your hearts. So could it be that sacrifice was all of that was just preparing ourselves to learn how to become living sacrifices? These are the sort of things that tie the Bible together, to turn it from just an abstract collection of facts and into something that both speaks to a real and living God and also turns us into real living people who can follow that God. So if you have any questions about this stuff, feel free to reach out. I had one person reach out. I had preached on Acts chapter 8, and the Bible just skips verse 37. And they wanted to know what that was all about and started talking about textual criticism. Great conversation. I wrote a little bit about that in a blog post a few weeks ago. But if you have any more questions like that, always feel free to reach out. I love talking about these things. All right, that's all I got. God bless.